root four elements on paper. We talk about root four elements. They include carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Okay, these are atomic numbers: six, fourteen, thirty-two, fifty, and eighty-two. With the <clears throat> with the atomic numbers, we can write the configurations. Carbon having six to be one S2, two S2, two P2. Silicon having 14, it will be one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P2. Yeah, then for germanium, I'm writing this because I want to come up with uh, uh, with a general outermost electronic configuration for these elements. So for germanium, we have one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P6, three D10, four S2, 4P2. 14 having 15, you have 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, mm -hmm. 3D10, 4S2, 4P6, 4D10, 5S2, 5P2. For lead, you have one S2, two S2, two P6, three S2, three P6, three D10, four S2, four P6, four D10. Then for F14, bring in a 14 orbital, rather an F orbital, then five S2, five P6, five D, 10, 6s2, 6p2. You can see that the outer configuration is having s2p2, sp, s, s2p2, 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 sp, s2p, this one is having uh, s2p2. But the figures beginning are different. The figures beginning are different. The figures beginning are different. So we shall end up saying this one we have two, 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 three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six. So we shall end up having that the general or the outermost electronic configuration for group four elements is N S2, N P2. Why? because they have gotten different starting values. So that's why we generalize them as N. So for carbon, it is two, two S2, two P2. For silicon, it is a three. For germanium, it is a four. Yeah, yeah, 14 it is five. And for lead, it is six. So that is what we are having there. So this is how we conclude the outermost configuration of these elements. All right, then uh, we can also look at um, we can also look at uh, before I go to bonding. Yeah, there is this fact of the inert pair effect of group four elements, inert pair effect. So uh, we have seen that they have the general outermost configuration of NS2, uh, NP2. So when you say the inert pair effect, let me first define it. This effect is the Inability of the two
outermost is electrons of group four atoms inability of the outermost s electrons of group four atoms to participate in bonding. But I want to discover what is the very genealogic behind this. You see, um, basically from carbon to lead, as atomic number, rather as atomic radius increases, okay? When the atomic radius increases, the outermost electrons, the two outermost electrons experience a greater nuclear attraction because they are poorly shielded by the electrons in the D and F orbitals. And that one ends up making the NS electrons less available for bonding. So basically, we are trying to say that uh, as the atomic radius increases, As the atomic radius increases, of course, from carbon to lead, the two, the two outermost NS electrons experience An increase the nuclear attraction. Spins an increase the nuclear attraction, and this is due to the poor screening. Due to the poor screening by the inner orbitals, by the electrons. In the D and F orbitals, which makes the NS electrons. There's a variable. for bonding, all right? That is the logic behind the inert pair effect, inability for the outermost S electrons to participate in bonding, okay? That is what we call the inert pair effect, okay? Uh, basically, we are looking at the tendency of the two electrons in the outermost atomic S orbital to remain unshared or to fail to participate in bonding. The less availability of NS2 electrons or the NS2 electron pair for bonding. In whatever form you can define it. Mm -hmm. In other words, the NS2 electron pair becomes inert. So we are looking at the inertness, okay? Or reluctance of the NS2 electron pair to get excited and take part in bond formation. One can let it be the non-participation of NS2 electrons in of NS2 electron, NS2 electron pair of NS electron participate in bonding. Okay, so that is what we are trying to talk about. Okay. So after looking at the, uh, the inert pair effect or the, uh, the 
inability of the NS2 electron pair to participate in bonding. So we are going to find out basically the effect, this effect is in group four elements. And that one now can take us to a different thing. We shall can look at the metallic character. This metallic character of these elements is very much applied in, uh, in the reactions and the bonding of these elements. So when we talk about metallic character, we want to see how metallic are they. We've got what we call carbon. Carbon is an unmetal. Carbon is an unmetal. Then we have what you call silicon and uh, germanium. Silicon and germanium, these ones we refer to them as metalloids. These are metalloids. Then we've got tin and lead. Tin and lead, now these ones are, are metals. But the metallic nature differs. Okay, so metallic character increases from carbon to lead. That's what we need first know. The metallic character increases from carbon to lead. Now, carbon being in an metal, but silicon and germanium are semi metals, but because we have said that metallic character increases down the group, rather, uh, yeah, down uh, from carbon to lead, and we've said that these ones are metalloids. You know, metalloids can behave to some extent as metals and to some extent as non-metals. Meaning that the fact that we say that metallic character increases as you move like this, means that germanium is more of a metal. Metalloids, they are semi-metals. So germanium is more of a metal and silicon is more of a non-metal. So uh, this one is more of a non-metal. But germanium is more of a metal. <clears throat> more of a metal than a non-metal, but still it has the, the non-metal uh, uh, character. Then tin lead. Tin lead are uh, metals, but uh, weakly electropositive metals. Lead is uh, much metallic compared to tin. Now, this one should take us to bonding. When we talk about bond, when we talk about bonding, you look at carbon itself. When you look at carbon, I'll just summarize this. Bonding. When you talk about carbon, uh, for example, when you consider diamond, let me let me remind you from our uh, uh, olive oil. So I've just sketched something like this. Show you for an example of like diamond. You know, we know that in diamond, each carbon atom is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms. If this carbon atom is bonded to four others, this is one, this is bonded to this one, two, three, four. And as a result, we form a tetrahedral structure. If you look at this. You have ended up forming a tetrahedral structure. 
And this tetrahedral structure is continuous in that you end up forming a giant molecular structure. It is continuous. Even this one will be bonded to four others. This one will be bonded to four others, you see? It will be bonded to four others, all right? Uh, this one is bonded to one, two, three, four, it is very continuous, even this one will be bonded to four others. So you end up forming a giant molecular structure. That is for diamond because carbon exhibits allotropy whereby it exists in different forms and the first form is diamond. So in diamond, each carbon atom is conventionally bonded to four other carbon atoms which form a tetrahedral structure that is continuous to form a giant molecular structure. Well, large, in graphite, also another allotrope of carbon, in graphite, each atom is covalently bonded to three other carbon atoms, and we end up forming the hexagonal layers. All right. Uh, in, the diam uh, in the graphite, in graphite, you have uh, hexagonal layers, whereby you have, uh, you have, uh, you have your carbon atom, each carbon atom bonded to four uh, to three others, okay? Um, you have something like this. You have something like this. So each carbon is bonded to three others, okay? Even this carbon will be bonded to a carbon. So you end up forming the hexagonal layers, as you can see. I'm trying to draw you the structure. Of graphite, right? So you draw other layers down, other layers down. So you realize that Still here, yeah, we shall have other hexagonal layers. You can even first do an hexagon. But on each, we have got a carbon. So this carbon lay, uh, these layers slide on each other, okay? They slide on each other, and that is what causes this. Um, they slide of each other, over each other. And as a result, the uh, strength is not that much because of the weak van der Waals forces of attraction that holds them together. So you realize that, uh, you realize that these, the layers keep sliding on each other. Okay, of course, so one can draw as, as big as possible, and this is the first layer, this is the second layer, one can continuously draw other layers, and these ones are the covalent bonds, which hold, these strong covalent bonds hold the carbon atoms, but 
the layers slide each other, okay? Over the hexagon, these hexagonal layers slide over each other. And these, these, these forces of attraction are what we call the weak Van der Waals forces of attraction, weak Van der Waals forces. Okay, these are weak Van der Waals forces of attraction. Then here, this is where we have our carbon atoms. So that is the, the bonding form of these. Uh, these are the bonding forms of carbon uh, uh, I, uh, allotropes. But when you look at silicon and germanium, silicon and germanium have got a giant molecular structure. Okay, they have got a giant molecular structure. Right, each silicon and germanium atom is uh, covalently bonded to four other atoms, and they also form the tetrahedral structures, okay, uh, which are continuous to form the uh, to form giant molecular structures. When you look at tin and lead, they have being metallic, they have giant metallic structures in which atoms are, are held together by strong metallic bonds. However, the strength in metallic bonds is much compared to tin. Now, here can be a question of physical properties. Which physical properties do you have to explain? If, for example, the one of melting points, you have to explain using the aspect, using the aspect of the of bonding. They can give you let's summarize some. Basically, physical properties of these elements and uh, of elements of group four. Basically, I'm interested in I'm interested in uh, this. Uh, I'm interested in melting point. Okay, I'm interested in melting point. And maybe we see how we can uh, uh, go about it. So a question can come, they give you a table showing the melting points of group four elements. So yeah, I can put an element, can put atomic number, And melting points. Uh, carbon, they specify diamond, and they, they gave three five five zero. No, 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 no. To make number six, melting point three five five zero. We have silicon 14, 1410. Then we have germanium, 32, 937. Fifteen fifty two three two lead eighty two three two seven. Here can come this, and they say plot a graph of melting points against atomic numbers, and hence explain the trend. Okay, trend. Basically, you can even expand a trend by looking at the values. But to plot this, of course, you know the rules of plotting have a title. Have a title. Uh, scale should be appropriately chosen. Label your scale very well. 
plot very well and also interested in the shape of your graph. So one can, you know, each axis has, need, has got to have its own starting point. So maybe here one can start from zero. Because there we have 3,000 and the, the lowest value is 200. So one can use a 500, 1,000, 1, 2,000. 3,500, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3,500, something like that. So you can use a scale of 500, 1,000, 1,500, something like that. So I want everyone to plot this on their own and you see how you can, what you will come up with then the axis one can start from one can start from six itself when you start from six itself it means that your graph would be starting from this very point maybe but if you can wish you can also start from like zero you go to maybe five something like that or you can say zero 10, 20, up to maybe 90. You plot and you find your graph. You find your graph something like this. It will be like this. I want everyone to plot. Of course, when you're plotting, you use a dot and a circle, a dot circle, a dot circle. There it will move for like this, then like this. Of course, you have to label. This was carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead. So, of course, your graph must be having access well labeled, melting point in watts, degree Celsius. Here, you'll have atomic numbers. Now, when you're telling me about the trend, you can even see from the table that melting point decreases from carbon to tin and then slightly increases from tin to lead. You can see it decreases from carbon to tin and then slightly increases from tin to lead. Whenever you start any explanation, you have to first give me the general trend. You have said that melting point decreases from carbon to tin and then increases slightly from Tin to red. So that is a map. You have told me the general trend. Then you have to tell me why carbon? Why is it that carbon is having the highest melting point? When we go to oxides, we shall find them having their different information. The oxides will be having their different information. So it is not by surprise that we shall have them behaving differently. Okay, you'll find now for oxides, for example, carbon dioxide will be having the lowest melting point. Okay, that is for the case of the dioxides. Now, when you look at the melting point decreasing from carbon to tin and then increasing from tin to lead, you have to account for this. Why is it that carbon is having the highest? Now, because the, the general point the general point is all about uh, uh, the large number of short strong carbon covalent bonds, okay? Carbon has the highest melting point because it has a large number, carbon has got a large number of short 
strong, short and strong. When the bond is short, then it is very strong. It's like when they give you a piece of chalk, which is very short as this, and they say break it. It is very hard. So something short is hard to break. So it has a large number of short and strong covalent bonds, which require high amount of energy to break. It requires high amount of energy to break. Because before melting takes place, the bonds must first be broken. So it requires high amount of energy to break before it melts. <clears throat> that is it. But you know, from carbon to germanium, because there is that, that sharp, uh, there is that decrease, serious, a sharp decrease. So from carbon to germanium, the atomic radius increases. And when the atomic radius increases, the bond length, when the atomic radius increases, it means that the electrons are far away from the nucleus, or the nuclear attraction is weak. A weaker nuclear attraction, the nuclear attraction is weak. Now, the bond length will increase as the atomic radius increases. And when the bond length increases, the bond strength decreases. When the bond strength decreases, then it means that it requires lower amounts of energy, okay? It requires the lower, or it requires lower amount of energy uh, uh, for the bonds, those covalent bonds in silicon and germanium to be broken. I'm talking about silicon and germanium separately because they have got uh, uh, the same type of bonds, okay? So we say that from carbon to germanium, atomic number increases. And when atomic number increases, the bond length also increases. When the bond length increases, the bond strength decreases, bond strength decreases. When the bond strength decreases, what do you expect? Low amount of energy is required to break those bonds. Hence a decrease in melting point. But still, uh, from germanium to tin, from germanium to tin, there is that further decrease in melting point. And the further decrease in melting point is because of the weaker metallic bonds in the tin. But then, uh, uh, melting point increases slightly from tin to lead simply because there is an increase in metallic bond strength as a result of the inert pair effect. So, if you're trying to explain the train, I would expect you first give me the general shape, the, the general information that melting point decreases from carbon to tin and then increases slightly from tin to lead. You start giving me the reasons. Carbon has the highest melting point because it has a large number of short and strong covalent bonds, which require high amount of energy to break before it melts. Then you tell me that from carbon to germanium, atomic radius increases, bond length increases, bond strength decreases and lower amount of energy is required to break the covalent bonds. Then you tell me that a further decrease in melting point from germanium to tin is because of the weak metallic bonds of tin or in tin. Then you also tell me the melting point decreases, or rather increases slightly from tin to lead due to increase in strength of a metallic bond in tin as a result of the inert pair effect. That is how one can talk about that. 
So from there, from there, I'm taking you to catenation of carbon. Catenation of carbon. Catenation of carbon. Catenation of carbon. When we say catenation, ability of an atom to form long chains of identical atoms. Okay. Ability. Of an atom. Form long chains of the identical atoms. That is what we call uh, catenation. Now, um, uh, out of the few elements that do catenate, you include carbon. Okay? And we are going to find out that uh, carbon carbon atoms can link up or can link covalently to form the stable chains, okay? Which may contain from two carbon atoms up to a very big number of the carbon atoms. And in these chains, only two valences of carbon are used, leaving uh, uh, the other two free to link with other atoms or other carbon atoms to form the branched chains. Okay, so we have said that in the catenation, we use two valences of carbon, leaving the other two to link up with the other atoms or the carbon atom itself. Okay, so these chains, we are going to find out that uh, they work as a skeleton, or they act as a skeleton on which many organic compounds can be formed. Okay, now for an element to be able to catenate, it must have a valence of at least two. So that when two valences are used, the other, the, the two can be used, or if they are more than two, the other two can be used to link up with other atoms or more of itself, okay? So uh, we have said that uh, it must have a valence of at least two and it must be able form strong covalent bonds with itself, with itself. Now, this carbon for it, it's able to do catenate because it has got the small atomic radius. And this enables it to form stable and strong carbon-carbon bonds. I'm trying to mean a case whereby carbon can be able to bond to another, to another carbon, can be able to bond to another carbon, but, uh, other valences of carbon can be used to bond to other elements. It can be hydrogen, it can be. Hmm? So we have said that we form a wide variety of organic compounds as a result of the catenation of carbon. Hmm? Like this, like this, like this. So something like that. That is what we are calling catenation. So the bonds can be continuous, but in simple terms, that's what you call catenation. The atom to undergo catenation must be able to form long chains with itself or with other atoms, but it must have a balance of at least. And we said that carbon is able to because it's got the smallest atomic radius that enables it to form the strong and stable carbon-carbon bonds. This lesson is going to be concluded with the uh, oxidation states for elements. So, common question. 
about uh, the oxidation state, it's a very, very, very common question, whereby you can be told to state the oxidation states that are exhibited by group four elements. And two, you can be told to describe or to discuss the stability of these oxidation states using the chlorides of group four elements or the oxides of group four elements. So it's a very, very common question. But before we go any further, you need first to know what oxidation state is. When we say oxidation state, it is that number that is assigned to an element in a chemical combination that represents uh, the number of electrons lost or gained. Okay. By an element or by an atom of that element in the compound. Oxidation state. We assign a number to an element in a chemical combination, meaning that you have a compound, but you've assigned a number to an element within that compound to represent the number of electrons gained. That is if the number is, is negative or lost if the number is positive. So uh, when you say oxidation state, this group, uh, group four elements exhibit plus two oxidation state and plus four oxidation state. So in case you are told to state the common oxidation states exhibited by group four elements, just write plus two comma plus four. Failing to put a sign can cost you because it can be positive or negative. So one, what if one adds for you a negative? Mm -hmm. So after knowing these oxidation states, we can be interested to know further how these oxidation states can as uh, the we can go ahead to look at the stability of oxidation states. from carbon to red, <clears throat> and we can use we can use chlorides and oxides of these elements to discuss the stability. So if a question comes and they tell you to discuss the stability, discuss the stability of group of oxidation states using the chlorides. Let's begin with the chlorides to discuss the stability. Chlorides. Using the chlorides. If we had to use the chlorides to discuss the stability of these oxidation states, now, you need first consider, if you consider the tetrachlorides, because we know we have dichlorides and tetrachlorides. So if you consider the tetrachlorides, we've got, uh, consider tetrachlorides of group four, we have got carbon tetrachloride, we have got silicon, tetrachloride, we have got germanium tetrachloride, we have got tin tetrachloride, we have got lead tetrachloride. All these tetrachlorides are liquids. Eh? Now, all these ones are stable from carbon to germanium, they are all stable. But the retrochloride of tin, under strong heating, it decomposes from tin to chloride, which is a solid and chlorine gas. 
Same applies to the chloride. For it even at room temperature, it can decompose. Okay, slightly it decomposes. At room temperature, it can decompose. But when you heat it, then it's spontaneous and readily decomposes. So we form also little chloride, solid plus chlorine gas. Now, when you are describing this after having shown me how tetrachlorides behave, you need to tell me that the carbon tetrachloride, you have to use words, carbon tetrachloride, silicon tetrachloride, germanium tetrachloride, they exist, but are stable to heat. They exist and are stable to heat. But tin, tin four chloride or tin tetrachloride, okay, on strong heating decomposes, on strong heating decomposes are to form <clears throat> tin for chloride, form tin two chloride and chlorine, all right? Then the lead for chloride, for it, it is generally unstable. That's why even to decompose at room temperature is unstable, it decomposes, at room temperature, from lead to chloride, it decomposes to form lead to chloride and chlorine. Now, meaning that the plus two oxidation state, the plus two oxidation state is more stable than the plus four oxidation state for compounds of lead. Because the plus four oxidation state is not stable, but the plus two oxidation state is stable because this one may not, <clears throat> may not readily decompose. Meaning that for compounds of lead, because we have said that an oxidation state is that number assigned to an element in a compound. Now, the plus two oxidation state is more stable than the plus four because the plus four lead for chloride has decomposed already meaning that it is the plus four oxidation state is unstable. Okay, so that is what, uh, that is what we have. Now, for compounds of lead, it is the, the plus four oxidation state that is unstable and the plus two oxidation state is stable. Now, carbon two, these were tetrachlorides, but, we have seen that this one is the, the their plus four is very stable. This one is the, the tetrachloride, their plus four oxidation state is very stable. But the plus four of lead is not stable. The one of this one is stable, but on heating state decomposes. So the plus four oxidation state decreases from carbon tetrachloride to lead tetrachloride. All right. Uh -huh. um, now we've seen that with the plus two oxidation state for carbon two chloride, silicon two chloride, they don't exist. Hmm? Carbon two chloride, this carbon two chloride does not exist. Silicon two chloride that also does not exist. But tin two chloride and lead two chloride exist with increasing stability. So, meaning that uh, the plus two oxidation state increases from carbon to lead, whereas the stability of plus four oxidation state decreases from carbon to lead. 
That is it. Plus four, oxidation state decreases. While plus two increases. Okay. Uh, let let me let, get me right. We say that the plus four oxidation state decreases like this. Plus four decreases, not it decreases. But the plus two oxidation state, these ones are very stable, so it increases from carbon to red, the plus two. The plus four decreases while the plus two increases. As simple as that. So that is how we can use the chlorides to discuss the oxidation, the oxidation state. But if you use oxides, using dioxides, When you look at carbon dioxide is a gas, silicon dioxide is a solid, germanium dioxide is also a solid, tin dioxide is a solid, lead dioxide is a solid, but that solid decomposes at higher temperatures, maybe 300 to form the two oxide and oxygen gas. Now, when you look at this, it shows you that the dioxides of carbon dioxide, silicon, germanium, and tin are all stable. These ones are all stable. But the lead, the dioxide of lead is unstable. Okay? So when you're explaining this, you tell me that carbon dioxide, silicon four oxide, germanium four oxide, tin four oxide, exist and are stable to heat. But lead four oxide exists but decomposes on heating to form lead two oxide and oxygen, implying that the plus two oxidation state is stable, whereas the plus four oxidation state in lead is not stable. The fact that the plus two oxidation state is the one which is stable, it means that the plus four oxidation state decreases, the, the stability of the plus four oxidation state decreases while the one of plus two increases. Okay, so we've seen that uh, when explaining, tell me, first consider the dioxides, okay? Then you decompose this and tell me that these ones do not, they exist, but they do not decompose. They are stable to heat. But lead oxide exists, but decomposes on heating from lead to oxide and oxygen, implying that the plus two oxidation state is more stable in lead because this one may not decompose far. It's more stable in, in lead, okay? But now when you consider the monoxides, the monoxide of carbon, that is carbon monoxide, it exists and is oxidized to form a more stable carbon dioxide. So it's oxidized to form a more stable carbon dioxide. Okay. Uh -huh. Silicon two oxide, germanium two oxide, they are unstable and they undergo disproportionation to form uh, the stable dioxides of the elements, okay? Silicon two oxide, that is SiO, and germanium two oxide, that is GeO, okay? They are, they undergo, they are unstable, and that's why they are, they undergo disproportionation from silicon and the dioxides, which are very stable.
what does it imply? It implies that the stability of plus two oxidation state increases. That's why the monoxides are not stable, meaning that uh, these monoxides are not, the monoxides are not stable. That's why they undergo disproportionation. That's why carbon monoxide undergoes oxidation. So being not unstable causes the plus two oxidation state. What is the oxidation of plus two? To decrease. Okay. To decrease, rather to increase oxidation, plus two oxidation state increases as you move. Then the plus four oxidation state instead decreases, uh, the plus four decreases as you move down. Why? Because the lead, the last one, the lead four compound is the one which is decomposing, meaning as you move down, the stability of positive four oxidation state or plus four oxidation state decreases. But because the monoxide of lead does not undergo any disproportionation or any oxidation or any decomposition, it means that the plus two oxidation state of lead is very stable. While these ones, they are the oxidation, their monoxides undergo some reactions and decompositions, and therefore uh, uh, the plus two oxidation state increases, meaning that from this side, the monoxide, if you consider carbon monoxide, silicon monoxide, germanium monoxide, tin, uh, lead, these ones are unstable. Why well, this is very stable. So it means that the plus two oxidation state increases down. While they are, they are dioxides, this is why it exists as a plus four, germanium, all these ones do not undergo decomposition apart from this, meaning that uh, the plus four oxidation state stability decreases now from here to here, as simple as that. So the variation in the stability of these two oxidation states, of course, is due to inert pair effect. So in case there is a question, uh, you will need maybe to, to have it answered. I will need to have that uh, question answered in the uh, in the due in the due course um there is a question about these oxidation states that i would want us to to go through here was a question of uh, describing the trend in metallic nature of elements I think we can we can uh, have an answer to that question. The trend of metallic nature okay state the trend in metallic nature. The trend in metallic nature of group four elements. <clears throat> and explain your answer. Now, we say that, of course, carbon is an unmetal, silicon, germanium, same metals or metalloids, tin and lead metals, meaning the metallic nature increases down the group.
the dark nature increases down the, down the group. Why? Because as atomic number increases, okay, as atomic number increases down the group, of course, the nuclear attraction for the outermost electrons or for the outer electrons decreases. Thus, the tendency of atoms to lose electrons increases down the group. As atomic number increases down the group, the nuclear attraction for the outermost electrons decrease and the tendency to lose electron becomes easy or increases down the group. Then, of course, the main aspect from this video was about introduction and then the main point of oxidation states. When they want you to explain the oxidation states, the stability of oxidation states, I've told you, maybe consider the tetrachlorides, if they have specified, can also specify, consider the tetrachlorides, if you consider the tetrachlorides, you write those with equations the way you are showing you. Tin four chloride and the lead four chloride will undergo decomposition. And then you tell me that carbon tetrachloride, silicon tetrachloride, and germanium tetrachloride, they exist and are stable to heat. Tin four chloride on strong heating decomposes to form tin two chloride and chlorine. That four chloride is unstable, decomposes, or even at room temperature, Form lead to chloride and chlorine. Thus, the plus two oxidation state is more stable than plus four oxidation state for compounds of lead. Okay. Then you talk about the dichlorides. Carbon two chloride and silicon two chloride do not exist, but tin two chloride and lead two chloride exist with increasing stability down the group because we said that the dichlorides are very stable, meaning the plus two oxidation state is more stable as you move from carbon to lead. So therefore, the plus two oxidation state increases from carbon to lead, well as the stability of plus four oxidation state decreases from. Yeah, the same applies to the dioxides. You consider the dioxides, carbon dioxide, silicon dioxide, germanium dioxide, tin dioxide, lead to oxide. Lead to oxide is the one which decomposes. So you tell me that the other dioxide is carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin, they exist and are stable to heat. But lead to oxide exists, but decomposes on heating. Form lead to oxide and oxygen, implying that the plus two oxidation state is more stable in lead. The monoxides, we said that they, they oxidize, like for carbon monoxide, it oxidizes to form carbon dioxide, which is more stable. Silicon trioxide and germanium trioxide are unstable, but under, they undergo disproportionation. The fact that they are they are they had undergone something, it means that they are not stable. So the plus two oxidation state increases down lead to lead, whereas the plus four decreases down to lead. Okay, so in our next video, we are going to look at the chemical properties of these elements. Good time.